Well, he has many accomplishments. Army veteran, Grand Marshal for Fiesta Flambeau Parade, touring musician and conductor, and as he celebrates his 94th birthday, he has accomplished being a part of a congressional record. Introducing Alfred Sturkio. Congressman Joaquin Castro presented him with the honor today. The distinct privilege means his birthday will be published under tributes to highlight to the Congress House floor. Alfred served in the Korean War and and even received a Purple Heart. He had this message today. For those uh, that might view this, God bless you and may you have a, uh, a happy life in memory of that who may be deceased from your family. And he says despite how hard war is, he still felt uh, has, he has fond memories and he is proud to serve his country. Thank you for your service, sir. The SA Festival of Diwali Lights is uh, happening right now until midnight. It is the 14th year for that event. It is India's biggest and most important festival of lights. It celebrates the triumph of light over darkness or good versus evil. It features music, dancing and food and the uh, culture of India. The event in San Antonio, also one of the biggest city led events in the nation. So we truly are a confluence of cultures that is part of our history. It's a place where the world meets and we're very proud of that uh, culture and diversity. That's how we make such a unique uh, community here in our city. Again, it's Diwali, the Festival of Lights, and uh, this year marks the 75th anniversary of the foundation of the Republic of India. And Chennai has uh, been the sister city of San Antonio since 2008. And we do believe those fireworks we saw earlier are part of the Festival of Light celebration. You are an investigator and you got to it and I, found I out it who it was. On the phone. <laughs> Did you see, okay. Yes. Got it. Great. Adam. Hi. <laughs> yeah, so very fall like finally today after a very spring like week. So it's yeah. nice to have this little break from the mugginess over the weekend. It was good timing, good for outdoor activities and any gatherings this evening. It all changes as we go into Monday. Our weather headlines basically tomorrow's going to be another fall like day, crisp and cool in the morning. Then the humidity quickly returns and with it some dampness as well. Not the kind of dampness we're necessarily looking for. You look at the rain chances, 0% tomorrow, but then we get into Monday at about 30 to 40%. Don't expect much in terms of accumulation or coverage, but we will have some sprinkles to very light showers periodically. I think the first half of Monday and then that 10 to 20% chance the rest of the week is just for morning drizzle and sprinkles. That's about it. All right, let's get to the big picture. You look across the state, some higher clouds coming in from New Mexico, Panhandle, West Texas as well. The action that we had yesterday, it's a system that's falling apart, but it's moving off to the east. Still a decent amount of precipitation around the Great Lakes and some of the clouds stretching southward down to the Gulf of Mexico. It's that time of year when you get these systems and the cold fronts that go from Canada down into the Gulf of Mexico and another system moving into the upper Midwest, but that's not going to be affecting us around here. Ours is more of a localized effect that we're going to be having. The wind is going to pick up out of the southeast and tomorrow we'll have a lot of sunshine. Here's our future cast for the rain and cloud cover tomorrow. Mostly sunny, but very quickly after midnight tomorrow night, early Monday morning, the clouds will fill in because of the wind out of the southeast. It'll increase the humidity and give us those low clouds in place. And those low clouds are then going to lead to fog drizzle dampness and even a few sprinkles. Look at 5 a.m. Some hit or miss, very light showers here and there. Uh, that's what we're anticipating for the morning commute on Monday. I know Monday back to work, back to school. Not the easiest way to wake up when you have that gray dampness outside, but we'll take every hundredth of an inch that we can get officially at the airport because this is a first place I don't like to be in and that's the driest year to date on record. Crazy to think, but the year is starting to wind down. We're running out of time. We've only had 9.26 inches of precipitation. The next driest year was in 1917 with just one tenth of an inch more than us. That's all we need is a little bit more, 11 hundredths of an inch, and we get out of that first place. So we're hoping for that, but I don't think the odds are great for it the next few days. Hey, 53 this morning, 78 in the afternoon, very seasonable. Temperatures right now in the 60s, even 59 in Rock Springs, Pleasanton 65, New Braunfels at 58. Worst fest time. Good weather for worst fest. 
I'll see you there tomorrow morning. Hey, Rio Medina is 62 right now. And tomorrow morning, we're going to start the day in the low to mid 50s. Near 50 in the Hill Country, Bandera at 50 along with Bulverde, and then Floresville about 55, Divine 53. When the humidity returns, big change is going to be morning temperatures. So low 50s again tomorrow, but look at Monday. We're up to 70 degrees. At the bus stop on your way to work, you do not need the sweatshirts Monday morning or really the rest of the week because it's going to be sticky and just warmer out. Dew points are nice right now. I mean, they're in the 40s at the moment. It feels good. You had that nice crisp fall air, but this wind from the Gulf of Mexico, that's going to be increasing. And look what happens. By tomorrow evening, our dew points creep back up near 70 degrees. Even here in San Antonio, Hill Country, you'll be getting that humidity overnight Sunday night and early Monday morning. And that dew points going to the high dew points are going to stick around all the way through the basically the entire week. 52 at 6 a.m. by noon tomorrow, we're up to 78 degrees, a lot of sunshine, high temperature of 84. I think most of us will be in the mid 80s tomorrow afternoon and then low to mid 80s the rest of this week. Next cold front early Friday that could have a decent impact on our temperatures by next Saturday. We could be looking at highs in the mid 60s. How about that? We'll yeah. take it. Got to remember to turn that clock back tonight. Isn't oh, that tonight? that's right. That is we do turn the clocks back here and what 2 a.m. Yeah, yeah. So just extra, do it tonight so you don't you're, you're not yeah. like confused in the morning <laughs> extra hour to hang out and do fun stuff <laughs> all right andrew utsa needed a little extra time to take care of their job today. ah dang it tim you took my segue utsa yeah. looked like they were in control of things in the fourth quarter against uav they just needed two extra overtime periods to finish the job but they got the job done when we come back we'll show you how they got it done plus uiw scores 70 points again got that too next UTSA looking for another statement win on the road against UAB, who is undefeated at home this year. We picked this one up in the first quarter. Roadrunners on the move. Frank Harris steps up and slings it to Oscar Cardenas. Wide open. One man to beat, and he throws the stiff arm of the year. Oh, my goodness. So strong, he tackled himself. 54 yards down to the 20-yard line. Next play, Harris finds Zakari Franklin for the touchdown, and UTSA leads 16-10 to 10 at halftime. We fast forward now to the fourth quarter, and the Roadrunners starting to pull away. Harris hooks up with Franklin again, this time for a 12-yard touchdown. Tack on a two-point conversion, and UTSA has a comfortable 14-point lead, 31-17. to 17. Game over? Not quite. John Jay grad Jacob Zeno rallies the Blazers with this 38-yard touchdown pass with 15 seconds left. Unbelievable. We are tied at 31 and heading into overtime. Both teams trade touchdowns in the first OT, but in the second, UTSA pulls away for good. Harris to a wide open Joshua Sipas for the 14-yard touchdown. Roadrunners defense gets a stop on the next drive, and UTSA wins their sixth straight game, 44-38 in double OT. Early in the season, you know, we went to we U of H and overtime, we didn't come out successful. You know, Army, we came out successful, so I think we just prepared for these moments. You know, we came out victorious today, so we just cherish this win. We're just so mentally tough that we really do believe in the triangle. We, we just believe it. Our kids just, they won't go away. And that game was a lot like life. There are a lot of good things in life. There's a lot of bad stuff in life. And whoever has the ability to stick to it, they, that old word, stick to itiveness, we just, we just stick to it. Wide receiver JT Clark left the game in the first quarter with an ugly leg injury and did not return. Roadrunners will host Louisiana Tech next weekend. It is homecoming for UIW football. Cardinals hosting Houston Christian this afternoon, and they're in an unusual spot, down by three early in the first quarter. But after the defense gets a stop, Cole Wilson feels this punt, returns it 37 yards all the way to the Husky 38-yard line. And then five plays later, the Cardinals find the end zone. Lindsey Scott Jr. fires for Brandon Porter, who makes a great grab for the 19-yard touchdown in a 7-3 lead. Scott throws seven touchdowns in the first half. Cardinals roll 73 to 20. They are nine and one. Trinity football on the road this afternoon taking on Millsaps. Tigers all over the majors in the first half of this one. Tucker Horn finds Baylor Jordan wide open for the three yard score. Trinity leads 26 nothing at halftime and the Tigers improved to nine and zero on the season with a 52 seven victory. TLU knocks off Southwestern 21 17 and Texas State falls to Louisiana Monroe 31 to 30. 
the Ewers and the Longhorns returned from their bye week to take on number 13 Kansas State on the road, and it didn't take long for the Horns to get on the board. Opening drive, Bijan Robinson bursts through the line, steps out of a tackle, and outraces everyone in the end zone for a 36-yard touchdown. Statement made, it's 7-0 UT. After the Wildcats tie it up, Longhorns answer back. This time, Roshan Johnson weaves his way to the goal line for the nine-yard score, 14-7 Longhorns, and they keep their pedal to the metal. 13 seconds left in the half. Ewers to Xavier Worthy. That's a three-yard touchdown. Horns lead 31-10 at the break, and they win it 34-27. Number seven, TCU back at home taking on Texas Tech this afternoon. Horn Frogs trailed 17-13 entering the fourth quarter, but the offense comes alive. Max Duggan threw two touchdown passes on back-to-back -back drives. Darius Davis had two touchdowns himself, and the Horn Frogs are 9-0. They win it 34-24. Baylor in Norman taking on Oklahoma. Bears up 31-28 in the fourth quarter and adding to the lead. Quaylen Jones gets a key block for the 10-yard touchdown, and that holds up as your game-winning score. Baylor knocks off OU 38-35. Boy, the seat is warming up for Jimbo Fisher. Aggies hosting Florida at Kyle Field today. First half was okay. Late second quarter, Delon H. Chain takes the handoff, powers his way over the goal line for the two-yard touchdown. A&M leads 24-20 at the break, but the second half turned into a mess. Third quarter, Anthony Richardson avoids the rush and finds Caleb Douglas for the 12-yard score. Gators score 21 unanswered in the second half to win it 41-24. The Aggies now have to win out to be bowl eligible. Coming up later in sports, it is the final night of the high school football regular season. It's scary to think how fast this season has gone, but we had some great action tonight. All right, thank you, Andrew. We'll see you again in just a little bit. You got it. Well, Metro Health is making sure everyone knows November is National Diabetes Awareness Month. The significance of their health fair today hosted on the east side. And two food places, both without the proper paperwork, one serving the public, the other serving students. But that's not all I found when I went behind the kitchen door this week. A college snack bar operating without a permit is told to immediately stop selling certain foods and a seafood restaurant is cited a second time for having an expired permit and a soda machine covered in slime. Let's go behind the kitchen door. Students at St. Philip's College Southwest Campus can grab a snack between classes at Pappy's, but their choices are pretty limited following a recent inspection where they earned a 79. Hot dogs were tempted 127 when they should be 135 or higher. Raw beef patties were stored touching bread and hot dogs. The employee didn't have a food handler's permit and several food items made off-site were missing required labeling. The business also didn't have the proper permit. Under their current permit, they are only allowed to sell prepackaged foods. They were ordered to immediately stop preparing hot dogs and hamburgers and other foods that require heating. The inspector noted roller hot dogs would be allowed if they installed several required sinks. Hi, I'm with uh, KSAT 12. I do the uh, behind the kitchen door. Uh oh. This worker was surprised to see me this week when I stopped by to see if corrections had been made. She had obtained the food handler permit, but they still need to update their permit, allowing them to make hot foods. For now, they're selling hot foods prepared off site. They brought them to me uh, at 10 30. Okay, so they're pre made somewhere else. You're not yeah. making them no, here. No, no, no. Okay. No, the worker said she's waiting for a sink to be added so they can expand their menu options. A reinspection was ordered. <laughs> SA Seafood at the 5200 block of Days of Allah earned an 81 on their recent inspection despite operating with an expired permit for nearly a full year. According to the inspector, the permit expired in September of 2021. It was cited as a violation at their previous inspection in February. An employee this time was seen checking their phone, then handled food equipment without hand washing. Another worker was caught eating in the kitchen. Containers of sauces, eggs, and cabbage were being stored on the floor. The soda nozzles had a slime-like substance on them, and the inside of the ice machine needed to be cleaned. That's what's behind the kitchen door. Tim Gerber, KSAT 12 News. That's me. Want to know who has good <laughs> scores and who doesn't? Well, we have a new tool for that. You can scan this QR code and take you with your phone right there to the mapping tool that will show you the scores for local food businesses. Those reports go back about six months and they're frequently updated.
Well, tight Senate races are bringing out some big names. Current and former presidents are pushing the vote in several states for Democrats and Republicans. ABC's Ty Hernandez shows us how the heavyweights are making the final push for votes nationwide. With just two more days until the midterm election, both parties are focusing in on the tight Senate race in Pennsylvania. Democrats bringing in the heavy hitters. President Joe Biden and former President Barack Obama joining forces in Philadelphia, urging everyone to cast their vote for John Fetterman. Your right to choose is on the ballot. Your right to vote is on the ballot. Social Security and Medicare is in the ballot. There's something else on the ballot character, truth, and facts, and logic, and reason, and basic decency are on the ballot. Democracy itself is on the ballot. The stakes are high. Former President Trump also in Philadelphia, making his case for the Republican candidate, Dr. Mehmet Oz. If you want to stop the destruction of our country and save the American dream, then this Tuesday you must vote Republican in a giant red wave. The first lady campaigning in the battleground state of Arizona, saying the midterms are a choice between two different versions of our country. What you do on November 8th won't just set the course for the future of Arizona. You'll decide the future of our country as well. The race between Arizona's Democratic Senator Mark Kelly and his Trump-backed Republican challenger Blake Masters has tightened. We need a red wave badly, right? And the Senate race in Georgia, also too close to call. Republican candidate, former NFL star Herschel Walker taking aim at Democratic incumbent Senator Raphael Warnock. It ain't about what he did in his personal life, it's what he's done as a senator. And he has failed as a senator, has he not? Tight races in Nevada and Washington as well. Republicans are hoping to oust incumbent Senate Democrats. Ty Hernandez, ABC News, New York. The story's trending now. Starting today, anyone on Twitter can get a blue check mark for just $8. It is the social media platform's verification system. It was put into place by new owner Elon Musk. It's all part of his effort to bring in more cash with Twitter's ad revenue being down. The subscription service launch comes just one day after nearly half of Twitter's workforce lost their jobs. Musk says there will be compensation and benefits through the end of the year and severance packages. But many are vowing to fight back, filing a proposed class action lawsuit against Twitter in federal court. Remember that song, I Want Candy? Well, Aaron Carter, the singer who found fame with that pop song, has died at the age of 34. The one-time teen idol started his recording career at the tender age of nine. A spokesperson for the L.A. County Sheriff's Office says deputies found him dead in the bathtub. It's early in the investigation, and there's no information yet on a possible cause of death. Aaron, who was the younger brother of Backstreet Boys' Nick Carter, rose to fame in 1997. November is National Diabetes Awareness Month, and Metro Health is bringing awareness through a health fair focused on just that. It happened today at the Davis Scott Family YMCA over on the east side. The fair featured health screenings, produce bag giveaways, COVID-19 vaccines, and workshops on diabetes prevention. District 2 Councilman Jalen McKee Rodriguez was also in attendance, leading a Zumba dance class. Organizers say it's all about keeping the community informed. Diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death here in Bear County, and so that's why we find it so important to bring awareness to this disease and also awareness to so many low-cost, no-cost resources that we have in our community in order to prevent or delay type 2 diabetes. Metro Health says it plans to host more no-cost diabetes health fairs in other districts that also have high rates of diagnosis. Well, more and more families are giving up their beloved pets. Coming up next, we're going to show you where some of those animals are ending up and maybe help you connect with one of them. It is an unfortunate trend we have been seeing all year. Packed animal shelters and the number of people adopting not able to keep up. And that's what has inspired several shelters to come together for a mass adoption event. The huge pet extravaganza featured 16 local shelters, all trying to get both cats and dogs adopted out. The animals available today were all microchipped and up to date on their shots. Organizers say they're seeing 
whether they can uh, get an owner or what right now what they're seeing is an owner surrender movement. We're seeing people getting rid of their family pet after years and rescues are the ones who are intaking those dogs and we're out of space I and mean, we are packed. So your rescues need you to adopt. Now she goes on to say that the sooner they get those shelters cleared out, the better they can help get some of those animal control animals out of those uh, places and uh, help them find homes. We'll be right back. All right. We have a, a reunion here that we never see. You, me, Adam. Yeah. It's Sunday night I'm party. I'm the only one working tonight. Saturday night party. <laughs> they decided to take off. <laughs> That's right. And uh, we're going to get an extra hour of sleep tomorrow, right? Yeah, actually, that's the one thing I forgot to remind everybody, you know, uh, <laughs> I feel like it's, it's in everybody's feed when they're scrolling through things. Right. <laughs> set the clocks back an hour. The ones that don't set themselves these days, that is the microwave, of course, and at least my microwave. I'm sure there's some smart ones out there that <laughs> do that nowadays. Those refrigerators with those touch screens probably. You can probably re get the refrigerator to do the yes, microwave. Yes, to do the microwave <laughs> and the oven while you're at it. All right, let's uh, take a look at our temperatures. This is for tomorrow morning, 52 degrees in the morning, another crisp, comfortable fall morning, but that changes Monday morning. Yeah, some jacket weather, sweatshirt weather tomorrow morning, Monday morning, though. No, 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 no. Just because we have, we'll have had it for a few days doesn't mean it's going to last into Monday. Bus stop heading out to work. You don't need the jacket. 70 degrees and humid Monday morning, very similar than the rest of the week, but a cold front should affect us by next weekend and it's pretty far away, but by next weekend I do anticipate anticipate another little reset in our temperatures across the state. Well, 60s and 50s really beautiful Alpine at 56 a neighboring El Paso 64 Amarillo at 57. And remember just yesterday evening we had snow just north of Amarillo uh, right now in town here, San Antonio at 66 degrees Corpus Christi 71 and 58 in Uvalde tomorrow morning. Low 50s for most of us. Hondo 53, Kerrville, Fredericksburg about 50, Canyon Lake 53 degrees. And then by tomorrow afternoon, we make it into the 80s. Most of us mid 80s, 84 Hondo, 81 Gonzales, 83 Canyon Lake. And I think you get to Von Army about 84 degrees, Lavernia 82. So a pleasant day tomorrow. And high temperatures aren't going to change much the rest of the week. All the way through Thursday, low to mid 80s. Then we get to Friday and Saturday. Notice that drop. I mentioned that cold front that's likely to hit us at some point Friday and it'll have an impact on our temperatures. I mean, high temperatures. Look at that down into the 60s potentially by next Saturday. So that's some very fall like air dew points. Of course, they've been down, so it's been comfortable. And not only does that mean the comfortable air when you have the dew points down in the 40s, but it also is an indicator of just how cool it can get at night because the temperature will can drop down to that dew point, but not below it. So when those dew points are up to 70 degrees, we can't get past 70 at night, and that's going to be our issue starting Monday morning. Dew points are nice right now, 30s and 40s, but the wind off the Gulf of Mexico, it picks up. This is noon tomorrow, still fairly pleasant humidity wise, but by tomorrow evening after sunset, oh, it's going to be sticky. That flow off the Gulf of Mexico, that wind, is going to take over San Antonio surrounding areas will be feeling it. And then by tomorrow, later tomorrow night, even into the hill country, that humidity is going to be moving on in. And that's going to give us some fog. Here's our future cast tomorrow. A lot of sunshine. Tomorrow's just more of the same, but very early Monday morning, we're going to start to see the low clouds fill in areas of fog and then little spritzes and sprinkles developing here and there for the morning rush hour. So reduced visibility Monday morning for the rush hour and some dampness, but mainly that nuisance dampness that doesn't really add up to much. So let's take a look at our case at 12 hour forecast tomorrow, 6, 7 a.m. 52 degrees, a lot of sunshine by noon. We're up to 78, so warming efficiently and quickly tomorrow. 84 the high temperature. We hit that at about 4 and 5 p.m. in a south southeasterly wind at 5 to 15 miles per hour. Monday morning dampness and then the morning fog and a bit of dampness is going to be the trend all week long with those high temperatures in the low to mid 80s. Next cold front Friday should kick up the wind, give us a slight chance of showers, but not the kind of rain chance that we're really looking for, unfortunately. So much for fall, huh? Mm -hmm. Remember to set the clocks back or you're going to be really early to church. <laughs> And it's happened to me before. It has. We're here to remind you. All right, Andrew, uh, here to remind you that Saturdays are for BGC. 
That's right, and this is the last weekend of the regular season. What better way to finish it off than with the frontier ball between McCollum and Harlandale? Got highlights from a great game at Southwest Legacy Stadium. Plus, Spurs are on the road in Denver. Got the highlights from that one, too. Next. We have reached the final night of the high school football regular season, and it features the Frontier Bowl at Southwest Legacy Stadium. Harlandale taking on McCollum. No score in the first quarter. Indians on the move. Quarterback Jacob Saucedo lobs it up for Pedro Valenzuela, who makes a great catch at the five-yard line. And two plays later, Saucedo keeps it himself for the one-yard score. It's 6-0 Harlandale. But here come the Cowboys. Early second quarter, Julian Roque mows down a pair of defenders on his way to the end zone for the four-yard touchdown. What a run. That ties it up at 6-all. Then later in the half, quarterback Justin Rodriguez keeps it himself, races to the pylon, and keeps his feet in bounds. That's a six-yard TD. Cowboys lead 13-6 at the break, and they win it 27-20. Here comes Sotomayor wrapping up their first full season of varsity football against Warren. Warriors moving the ball early. First quarter, Antonio Mesa goes deep for Elijah Real Sola. Did he he make the grab? Yes, he did. One foot in bounds for a gain of 31 yards. Then Adian and Teal caps the drive with his three-yard score. Warren goes on to win it 41 to 9. Last stop at the rock pile for the Tommy Bowl. Jefferson versus Edison. Mustangs up 14 to nothing and looking for more in the second quarter. Adrian Garces takes the pitch coming right at you. That's a gain of 25 yards all the way down to the 11-yard line. A few plays later, they punch it in. Austin Banda scores the one-yard TD off the inside handoff. 21-0 Jefferson. Let's head to the big game coverage scoreboard for that final and more. Jefferson wins it 34-14, and DeHennis defeats Centerpoint in their regular season finale 31-14. Congratulations to the Lytle Boys Cross Country team for striking gold this morning at the UIL Class 3A State Cross Country Championship meet in Round Rock. The Pirates scored five runners in the top 23 places. Johnny Alvarez was the team's best finisher in 16 minutes, 26 points six seconds. After last night's loss, our San Antonio Spurs hopped on a plane and flew to Denver to take on the Nuggets tonight. Good start for the Silver and Black. Jakob Pertl drives and banks it in. He's got eight points in the first four minutes of action. It's 11 to eight Spurs. A little later, Keldon Johnson hesitates and finishes with the lay-in. He had a team high 25 points. San Antonio down 40 to 27 after one. Second quarter, still trying to keep pace. Devin Vassell drains a corner three. 20 points off the bench for Vassell, but the Nuggets too good tonight. Denver leads 70-51 to at halftime. Spurs never really threaten in the second half. They fall 126-101. That is their third straight loss. For the second straight season, San Antonio FC will play in the Western Conference Final. This year, they're hosting it as the number one seed. In 2021, they traveled to Orange County, where they eventually lost in penalty kicks. Many returners from that squad believe the outcome would have been different had it been played at Toyota Field. But hosting the game is only one piece of the puzzle. They still have to perform. Having it at home against a great Colorado team doesn't guarantee us, you know, a spot in the, the actual final. So it's good. Like, uh, like we said earlier, it's going to come down to those details. We're gonna, the fans are going to be amazing. Playing in front of them in the semifinal was unreal. It was a packed house, hostile, loud, getting behind us, giving us that energy when we were, you know, kind of hurting throughout the game. The fans are great. Um, this is one of the toughest places to play. Talk to any guy in the league. Um, but yeah, those fans, I mean, that's what's going to propel us to, you know, hopefully win this game. SAFC versus Colorado Springs switchbacks tomorrow night at 730. And it has just gone final. Astros win the World Series 4-1 in Game 6. They take the Series 4-2. It's their second World Series title. Jordan Alvarez had the game-winning home run in the bottom of the six. We'll have all the highlights and reaction tomorrow at 530 and on Instant Replay. We'll be right back.